welcome. Ray Cepeda is presenting on advanced language training. If you are part of our Zoom and you are coming in through the Zoom link, just note that you should keep yourself on mute. If you have any questions that you'd like answered right away, feel free to put them in the chat. On Facebook, if you're watching us live, you may also use the chat there. And I will be fielding these questions if I feel like they need to be asked of Ray immediately, I may interrupt him briefly and, and ask your question right away, or we will save them for the end. So anything that is in the chat on Zoom or on Facebook Live will be asked um, of Ray Cepeda either right away or by the end of the presentation. Um, so go ahead and make sure that you're staying on mute and feel free to ask anything you'd like in the chat. Um, also, just a uh, reminder that to obtain CEUs, if you're here for that, you need to be here for the entire duration of the presentation. So without further ado, Ray Cepeda, take it away. Thanks, Marsha. Here, I'm going to just share my screen with everybody. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, hello everybody, thanks for joining us. So like Marcia said, if you are getting CEUs, then I'm going to be giving you three keywords over the course of the presentation. One just before we start, then one in the middle, and then one at the end to meet the BACB requirement for attendance. So what I want you to do is write down those keywords and then send them to me in an email which is Ray, R-A-Y, at abaskills.com. That's Ray, R-A-Y, at abaskills.com. Okay, so those words are not going to be repeated or clustered or written in the chat or anything. You just have to listen and watch, and then that's it. Okay, so before we get started, I'm going to give you your first keyword. So the first keyword is autodidact. Okay, autodidact, that is A-U-T-O-D-I-D-A-C-T. -T. Okay, that is keyword number one. Welcome to teaching language, negation, exclusion, past tense verb, describing and guessing. So we have a very short amount of time to cover a lot of material, but I really want to stress a couple of things. Number one, this free trial training is only going to get you so far when teaching these language skills. You have to get kids away from the table and practicing in real life with real activities, with real people, correcting them as they go, and making sure that a skill is not considered mastered until they can do it away from the table. Okay, or if you're only doing like teaching on the floor, whatever you're doing, if you're working with very young children, that's where it might be. You're working with older children, you might be at the table. What's even better for kids that um, don't have a lot of challenging behavior and you're in, well, not now, but maybe what you were doing and what you will be doing by taking them out into public and having them practice in the real world with real people is even a better measure of whether they can use these skills because skill acquisition and demonstration under tightly controlled conditions, as in discrete trial training, is not representative of a child's ability to communicate. All right, so we'll get that out of the way right, right off the bat. Okay, so the other thing that I want to make very clear is that um, the programming that I'm going to talk about tonight was either taken from or based on and um, modified by me based on uh, the work of Dr. Ivar Lobas. So I've been working with kids on the autism spectrum for 25 plus years. And I was very fortunate enough to um, be trained by people that work directly with Dr. Ivar Lobas. So Scott Wright and Linda Wright, who are the owners of the Lobas Institute now, gave me the bulk of the training in language development and flow charting and, and just about everything we're going to talk about tonight. And um, I think one thing that I really want to mention is that when we're talking about these skills, the negation, past tense verbs, describing, guessing, we, as the people developing programming, 
have to be super flexible, okay? It's not just transfer trials and distractors and blah, blah, blah. If your learner is not acquiring the skill, you have to have five or six different ways that you're going to be teaching these skills. And I learned that, which might uh, shock some of you that I learned doing that from the Lobos Institute. Because um, when I worked there, there was the, the, the um, most creative and flexible language development people that I have ever worked with. So anyway, since the curriculum I'm going to be talking about is not readily available to the public, what can you do and what are some of my favorite resources? So these are some of the resources that I think that you should have and all are readily available on Amazon or Barnes and Noble. You can buy a work in progress. If you don't have it already, it's a good resource, not only for you as someone that's developing curriculum, it's also uh, very good for parents because there isn't a lot of technical jargon. There's good chapters on sleeping problems, eating problems, behavior problems, and then the rest of the book is all about language development. And Ron Leaf and John McCacken outline very specifically how to teach certain skills, what comes before those skills, what you should be teaching after, etc. And it's an uh, excellent resource for you to have. Obviously, if you don't have Teaching Developmentally Disabled Children, the me book, I know it's a really super old book, but just get it because I think you'll be surprised by what's in there and that some of the ideas and some of the programming in there, while this was basically the very first resource that people really had, not a whole lot has, has changed since then. Now, I mean, the use of and the development of the motivative operation, that's a whole, that's a whole different thing. But as far as like how to be flexible in teaching some of these skills, this is a really good book to have. Obviously, you have Teaching Language to Children with Autism and Other Developmental Disabilities by Sundberg and Partington. Like, obviously, you have to have that because there's no reason why you shouldn't and you should be working on memorizing everything in all of these books as well as this one, Teaching Individuals with Developmental Delays by Dr. Lobos. Because in this, even though the programming is kind of the early learner level programming that most people know, I think you'll be surprised that um, that there's really great examples, descriptions, and again, he states specifically that before you teach the skill, your learner should have mastered these skills. And we're gonna talk more about prerequisites and the need to be properly identifying them, not necessarily teaching every prerequisite because you can probe a lot of those skills to see if the child is demonstrating some of them or is almost demonstrating some of them and not just going ahead and teaching them. This book called The Autistic Child, Language Development Through Behavior Modification, super, super old book, but just get it because again, I think you'll be fascinated by Dr. Lovas's just like loose anecdotal descriptions. And there's some data in there with, from some of the kids that he was working with about what they were teaching, how they were teaching it, why they were teaching, how long they had to work on a specific skill with a specific child in order for them to, to acquire it. It is really, really fascinating stuff. So um, like I said, since you don't have uh, access to the Lovas curriculum, um, these are some of the next best things to have. And of course, you want to have your Sunberg and Partington manual. These books I recommend to everybody because you just have to have them in your library. Obviously, this is um, excellent as far as just the science of behavior analysis. And here you get the philosophy of behaviorism. Okay, moving on, let's get started. So what typical development is and why you need to know it. So what we do sometimes is we look at kids who are atypical learners, and then what do we do? We put them in an atypical teaching arrangement to try to teach them um, the things that typical kids would, would be doing. And sometimes, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Um, so over the last two and a half decades, I found that it is really important 
to have a thorough understanding of what typical kids do, what they say, how they say it, why they say it, of course, and then having um, that knowledge in the back of your head while you're developing the curriculum for an individual child. Not just looking at a pre-published curriculum, because that's a no-no, that's not what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to say, here's this kid, here are his excesses, and here are his deficits, he's this many years old, here's what typical kids would otherwise be doing at this age, and then here are the skills that he's missing. Let me kind of like connect all of this like a puzzle. Let's get started teaching some of these things, probing for generalization, getting him away from the table, seeing if he can practice and demonstrate these skills away from the table, measuring how fast that he's learning those skills, and then going through that same cycle every like three, four, five, or six months, right? Say, here's what a typical kid's doing, here's what my kid is doing. Is, and then you have to ask yourself, is your client learning faster and faster as the skills get more difficult? Or do they continue to struggle kicking and screaming literally sometimes every single step of the way while you're teaching. So, I mean, these are all some of our challenges as the people that develop the language curriculum, but just keeping in mind that we want to stay focused on what typical kids do versus what our kids are doing and try to minimize the atypical teaching that we have to do. Of course, we have to do some discrete trial teaching with kids sitting at a table or on the floor and doing some drills, etc. I'm definitely not saying don't do that. I'm saying how much of it do you really need to do? That's what I'm saying. Think about that. So for example, what if you have a five-year-old with the following learning profile? He has no imitation skills. His vocal limitation is limited to one word. He can receptively label about 100 pictures, can expressively label about 25 pictures, um, but he can't complete a basic close-ended task drops to the floor when demands are placed and he has no matching skills. All right, so he's five, what might his program look like? It's a hypothetical, so we're not gonna spend a lot of time doing that, but, but you see what I'm saying. It's like, he's five, that's his profile. What is, what's a typically developing five-year-old doing and how am I gonna start getting this kid heading in that, in that specific direction? Again, what if your learner is about seven and functions on a 24 month old level and has no vocal language and has never been in an ABA program before. So what programs are you going to, to select? So seven, I mean, come on, a typical seven year old uh, does amazing things, right? But you as the person that's developing the curriculum, you have to be keeping in mind that your client is gonna be doing amazing things too. Because if you're not, you're doing your client a disservice. So let's just keep it, keep focused even though he has these challenges, this is where I want him to be, and here's my plan to get him there. And of course, the analysis comes in between here and here, and so that's gonna be up to you. Okay, here's another example of another learner. What if your learner's five, has good articulation, is echolalic, and knows many of the early and intermediate level programming, but only in a receptive format? Well, you know, what's your programming going to look like? So anyway, this is something that's very interesting. So I have a lot of resources on um, child development and typical development, and I'm sure that you do too. Again, I strongly recommend that you memorize all the various stages of language development so that when you meet your learner for the first time, things just start popping off in your head. He needs this, 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 and this. Why is he not doing that, but he's doing that? What's happening here? I'm gonna say this, I expect him to say that. He didn't say that, he said this, but that's actually something I wasn't expecting him to say, right? Because if you don't have that foundation, I think it's gonna be uh, challenging to get your kids to the levels that you really want them to get to. So, I think a fantastic resource that you can just access right now is actually on the ASHA website, which if I'm correct, should be right here. How does your child hear and talk? Look, they have this whole thing, birth to one year, one to two years, two to three years, three to four years, four to five years. 
excellent resource. And I'm not discounting kids that are older because right now I'm working with a lot of older kids on some early level programming, but that's fine because I expect them to go and do amazing things. All right, whether they're using vocal language or whether they're using an augmentative communication device. I want those kids to be effective communicators and you should too, because communication is a critical element that I feel is sometimes overlooked. Instead of, because imagine if you could just engage your learner and not have tokens and timers and schedules and this and that and that and that. Sometimes you have to have that stuff, I get it. But imagine if you did need to do that stuff because you are like 99% or 90% of the program that you're developing for him or her is all based on communication. It's all based on language. It's all based on not only requesting, but also rejecting. Then requesting using some other language forms like colors and functions and categories and yes and no and the things we're going to talk about tonight. Wouldn't it be nice if you could tell your learner, hey, first we're going to go here, go there and do this and do that. And then we're going to do something that you want to do. They understand that. And then they kind of just go with the flow. I mean, wouldn't that be nice, right? So anyway, let's get back to our ASHA website. So birth to one year. I'm not going to go through all of this, but let's just pull something up. Here's two to, two to three years. So it says um, hearing and understanding. So probably what we would just consider some receptive language. Understands opposites like go, stop, big, little, and up and down. Think of how hard it, that, that's like some of that stuff is to teach some of our learners. So that's two to three years. Follows two part directions. Get the spoon and put it on the table. Understands new words quickly. Well, that's that's pretty cool and then talking has a word for almost everything isn't that interesting so while we're teaching labeling endlessly and let's say you know you meet a learner and that child has 150 picture labels i'm sure you can look around the room that you're in right now there's probably 150 picture labels in there go into the next room and there's a whole a whole other set so like, again, this is what I'm talking about, about like you can't just do everything at the table. You're gonna do some stuff at the table, then get the kid up walking around, you know, you're, you're um, at, at his house or, or if it's a school, you're walking him around the room and getting him to identify the things that are in the room. So there's much more important because those are the things he's gonna be engaging with anyway, right? You bring him in the bathroom, have him label everything in the bathroom. Right, you bring them over to your desk, have them label everything that's on the desk. And so these are the things he sees every day, not just when you pull out the language builder card set or whatever card set that you're using, right? So by two to three, kids have a word for almost everything. Hmm, interesting. Talks about things that are not in the room. Well, that's certainly good. Uses, the, uses these sounds in words, uses words like in, on, and under, right? So they're already using prepositions, uses two or three words to talk about and ask for things, right? So not just requesting, not just rejecting, not, but actually talking about them, like using some descriptive language. That's, that's really good. People who know your child can understand him. Ah, well, articulation challenges please collaborate with your speech pathologist because some little Arctic things we might be able to tackle, but other things, no, that's like, I mean, it's been, my, it's been my experience. It's not my area of expertise. And so I rely heavily on some speech pathologists to uh, work with us so that we can shape up some of that stuff. Asks why. Hmm. Now we have, now we all know the whole like manding, uh, WH protocol, blah, blah, blah. But actually at two to three, they're asking why. That's complex. Puts three words together to talk about things and may repeat some words and sounds. Very, very interesting stuff. See, so this is what I'm talking about. When you meet your learner for the first time, this is all the stuff that should be just like floating around in your head. This is the stuff you should be thinking about. So even though you read all the evaluations, you did this history, but so even before you start collecting your baseline data to figure out where you're going to start, before you do the ABLES, before you do the BB map, 
know this stuff. Please, thank you. Okay, let's, <laughs> let's get back. So, what is next? Okay, why language and communication should be the primary focus of your child's program. Now, um, I've talked to some colleagues who are teachers, and um, believe me, I get it. In a school where there is an IEP that has all kinds of skills that have to be tackled, reading, writing, math, this, that, the other, it's very, very difficult to have like 90% of the kids' program be based in language. So the question is, so what do we do? So what, what I suggest when, when I get an IEP and it's packed full of skills that I know that the learner that I'm working with needs, I might just ask, can we reduce the number of things that are in the IEP? If the parent's on board, because the rationale is, look, he has these things that he's only going to be working with, like the speech therapist, or he has some one-to-one -one teaching during the day, and he has speech. Well, you know, if we kind of try to arrange within the daily schedule when he's doing one-to-one, -one, let's say he gets like a half hour in the morning, 20 minutes of that is all language. Then the other 10 minutes, you just shove in reading, writing, math, <laughs> right? The, because like all that stuff, that other stuff is gonna be important, but the communication is what's going to help him in real life. Yes, reading, writing, math is going to help him. Being an effective communicator could reduce the likelihood of challenging behavior, right? And I think that that's really what we're all looking for because I think that like, like me, like you, you probably have a lot of kids that we could say, well, if he could tell us what he wanted or what he didn't want, he probably wouldn't be screaming and tantruming right now. Well, okay, so let's teach him. <laughs> let's teach him how to reject the things. Let's teach him how to ask for the things. Let's teach him uh, how to get access to his favorite people, you know, as, as well as the items and his games and activities. Okay, right? So being an effective communicator may decrease the likelihood of challenging behavior. It may alleviate some or all of the needs for tokens, timers, and other things that make the teaching arrangement vastly different from the natural environment, right? Because we know that our kids aren't gonna be with us forever. And the more stuff we have to add to the teaching environment that makes, you know, for a good teaching arrangement, we get the kid under good instructional control and blah, 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 and he sits there and he's free of problem behavior and he's acquiring stuff. But then when he's not in the presence of all of this stuff, he doesn't demonstrate the skills that, that he has. So before we go jumping to that, what else can we be doing? Focusing on language development. Eventually at some point during, during the child's treatment, um, only using the table for the introduction of language skills, like the things we're gonna talk about tonight. Um, yes, you can sit at a table and discrete trial and drill the kid to death and he'll master the skills, but I feel that it's better, even though it might take longer to introduce the skill in some semi-structured format and then say, oh, let's go over here and play this game or let's go over there and have this experience that incorporates describing, guessing, negation, past tense verbs. And, you know, because so it's, it's more than just natural environment teaching. It is actual natural engagement, right? Because you're allowing the activity um, to facilitate you using the skills and testing to see if the child's actually meeting some, some specific requirement. So it's not just you with a clipboard and checking off because it's NET time, it's that you're having some fun. You're trying to play with them, remember they're kids. And so you might probe a couple of things, take, take a little bit of data, but not focus so much on the data that you can't actually keep the conversation or the exchanges going. So, Anyway, um, it would be great, again, like I said, if you can explain expectations for behaviors and contingencies and your child to be a little more flexible and go with the flow. I'll give you an example. I'm working with a little girl now. She's an amazing little girl. Her parents took on like the full responsibility of teaching her. So when she was diagnosed, she didn't really talk, but now, after her parents 
just did absolutely everything, especially her dad, did absolutely everything to get her to talk and to talk under natural conditions. By the time that like I came in, she was already labeling and doing some stuff. And literally within a year, she was able to go from just like labeling a bunch of stuff through the programming we're going to talk about tonight. And like now she's going to be mainstreamed into regular first grade if school ever opens. So, <laughs> so that's what's going on. But the entire focus of her home program was language, 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 and language. Let's take a look at something because prerequisites are really critical because it's not just about teaching something and getting the child to use it because you want to make sure that the foundation for those skills is going to be solid and they're not just going to lose stuff and you're going to wind up having to go back and reteach a lot of stuff. So I just want to use this example of what did you do in school today to talk about some prerequisite skills. So here's this question. What did you do in school today? Now I know that what we do with some of our kids is we'll ask the teacher, send a note home, tell us what you did in school today so we can see if he can say anything and be um, an accurate reporter of the events that went on in school. So that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to have the teacher send home something maybe that he made and you can say, what did you do in school today? And maybe the thing that he made is just in the environment where he could reference it if he wanted to, so hope that he might comment on it. Or if he has a schedule, you can show him the schedule and you can say, oh, so what'd you do in school today? And he says, well, we had music, art, gym, reading, writing, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Or what takes longer is to teach all of these other skills so that each word in this question exerts some specific control over the learner's response. So to answer a what question in this, in this form, you probably need all of your matching programs, receptive identification of objects and pictures, expressive labeling of objects and pictures, functions, locations, and WH discrimination. Okay, so then we come to the word did. So did is really the, the, the word the child's supposed to be listening to. Because it's not what are you doing or what are you going to do, it's what did you do. So did should exert very specific control over the learner's response because immediately they should start thinking about what happened earlier. And that whole concept of understanding your life in a temporal sequence um, is a discussion for another day about how to get a child to actually do that because you can do that um, for some kids. And right now it's just past tense. Did evokes past tense. Receptive actions, expressive actions, go went. If you're not familiar with that program, I'm sure you're familiar with the format. You instruct the child to go to some specific location. They go there, they do something. Then you call them back over and they say, hey, where did you go? And they say, I went. And then they tell you exactly where they went. Past tense verbs, two-dimensional. So it says 2D regular. So that's two-dimensional. Two, two so picture cards, right? You're saying um, you show the card and you say, what is the boy doing? It says the boy. The, the boy is clapping. Then you take the card away and you say, well, what did the boy do? So that's the, usually the child's first exposure to some kind of past tense, right? They see the picture, they label it, you take the picture away. What did the boy do? So now did starts to exert some control over the learner's response. Um, you need your past tense regular child actions where you have the child perform some specific action and then you ask that child, what did you do, okay? And then you also work on all the past tense up, must be generalized and a time delay implemented to build, build the skill of remembering. Because possibly, and, and you may need other verb tense programs depending on the child, but this is, but, but this is critical, teaching the skill of remembering. Now, I think in like a different workshop we have coming up, I'm gonna go over how to teach remembering because it is such 
a critical element because some of our kids learn stuff and then lose it. They learn it and lose it. And then higher level kids, they learn stuff. They may lose a little bit of it, but um, it's more about getting them again to organize their life in their mind in a temporal sequence. So you can talk about what you did on vacation last week, three days ago. Um, you know, hey, when it was your sister's birthday, what were you doing, et cetera. So, so all of that has to, um, <laughs> that has to be worked on. So remembering can definitely be tricky, but we can definitely shape up those behaviors. Okay, the word you. All right, so now we're getting into some pronouns. Well, before you teach pronouns, you need some basic receptive and expressive pronouns, body parts, because that's where the pronoun teaching starts, prepositions and possibly others depending on the child, and of course, all the, pre, all the prerequisites to prepositions. So here's one big difference about the LOBOS curriculum versus the um, uh, verbal behavior curriculum. So in the LOBOS curriculum, prepositions, so basically you do labels, colors, shapes, prepositions, right? It's um, that, that sequence where prepositions come much later, um, especially on the ABLES, which I'm more, more familiar with than uh, the VB map. But there's a lot more prerequisite skills to teaching the prepositions than just um, objects, colors, shapes, and of course, color of objects, shape of objects, and some question discrimination. But um, that would come um, right before prepositions. So prepositions is kind of like, like the first step of prepositions, it would be considered one of the early, um, a late early learner program for some kids, it might be mixed in with some of their early intermediate level programming. So then we have these words, do, similar prerequisites to did, in, prepositions, receptive labels, receptive colors, receptive shapes. You need school, picture labels, room labels, people labels, receptive community locations, okay? So then you have the word today. You need temporal discriminations. Today versus yesterday versus tomorrow, which is a vast number of prerequisite skills. And of course, prior in answering that question in a natural or untrained manner, the learner requires probably a bunch of other prerequisite skills. So that's why it's one thing to ask a child, what did you do in school today? And they say, well, I don't remember. Okay, well, that's fine. But for, uh, but for our kids, we have to make sure that they have all the skills that they need to answer the question. Because again, <clears throat> I realize there are uh, teaching procedures and techniques that we can use to get them to remember specific events that occurred during that particular school day. But to answer the question in a natural manner and actually give you enough information that allows you to build on it and to have some kind of conversational exchange, whatever that's going to look like based on the skills of your learner and whether they're using vocal language or whether they're using an augmentative communication device, they have to have the prerequisites in order to answer that question sufficiently, thoroughly, <clears throat> et cetera. Okay, let's keep going. Let's talk about some negation responses. So, these are some of the things that I like to do because it can be fun, but there's also a fine line because what you're doing is you're actually con contriving reflexive condition, motivative operations throughout the teaching. Some of these things you can just teach under instructional control, under the control of the SD, but actually for a lot of it, you have to, create a mild aversive condition in order for the learner to produce the language that you want them to produce, okay? So we look at uh, things that kids say, like all, all gone or gone, depending on the age of your learner. Little kids say gone, right? Um, they say no. This is not accepting no. I'm talking about them using no and not in a way that it's just randomized and discriminated with yes, but that they're actually find something aversive and then they reject it. Not as it relates to an event, not as it relates to an action. No, it's a blank, which I actually, which is under the negation category, but I put it in the exclusion programming for tonight. Um, I can't is something that our kids can, I mean, that I feel strongly that kids should, should know all of this, but that we, I don't often see people teaching these things. I don't know 
which there is a very easy way to teach it. And then there are some more abstract ways to uh, teach these things, which we're going to look at. And a subject can't action. Did you blank? I didn't blank. And then there's do versus don't. So this is not in any particular order. Um, these are things to consider when you are working on skills and what the prerequisite skills are to some of these negation responses. So let's talk about some ways to teach some of this stuff. <clears throat> so you can model the response when removing something at the end of the activity. Okay, so again, <clears throat> regardless of the age of your learner, think about what you would do with like a typical little kid, two, three, four years old. You'd say, all gone, right? There isn't any more, it's gone, it's all gone. So that's it, easy. And then they learn that when the thing is not there, that it's actually gone. You can model the response following the consumption of a preferred food or drink. Give the kid something to eat. He consumes it, say, oh, all gone. And if he asks for more or asks for it again, you say, it's gone. Then you could say, well, what happened? And then you prompt the child to say, all gone. And you say, oh, that's right, it's all gone. See, so, so, that, see, it's, so it's the context, it's not just drilling and drilling and drilling and drilling, it's teaching in the context. And I know that I keep saying this over and over and over again, because if there's one thing that, that you take away from this little talk tonight is that you just can't do everything at the table, right? A lot, most of this stuff is not going to get acquired at the table. They might be able to use these words under very specific tightly controlled conditions because you can try them at the table, but then when you want them to use them, they won't. So I'm gonna keep saying that over and over and over again. Have the child give you some of your preferred items or edibles. When the items are all gone, say, can I have more? Or is there more? Or where, where are the items? Where are the cookies? Where are the potato chips? And prompt the child to say, all gone or gone. And then you just fade, fade the prompts until they're responding independently, right? So one prerequisite to this, well, so a couple of things. One is a program called Be the Teacher which you can um, teach your learner to teach you some basic skills. And it goes a long way in teaching them um, to reciprocate, to um, be the person that is driving the conversation. It's not really a conversation because they're actually doing some, some, like something that looks like discrete trial instruction. But they're teaching you and providing you with feedback and you teach them to provide feedback based on whether you're correct or incorrect. All right, goes a long way. So they, you, you, you have the be the teacher format. And then you also have generalized imitation skills because you have to have a child that can imitate anything when they're not only when they're told to, but when they're, un, um, when they're unsure of what else that they should be doing. They should be able to reference somebody in the environment and start doing something similar. It doesn't mean that they're imitating every action like a robot, which would be weird, but I'm just saying. If um, they're standing and all the other kids are sitting, maybe they should be sitting too. If they're in a classroom and they're at a circle time and everybody gets up and uh, leaves the circle and goes to a table, they should recognize that everybody got up and just left and went to the tables and maybe they, they should imitate that and do the same thing. That's what I mean by generalized imitation. Not just, I, you know, hey, I, I told the kid do this and he did it and I, and I never taught it to him. Well, that might be good, but let's just like keep our focus that that's a skill level here and we're talking about getting them like all the way up here because this is where they need to be in order to get by in the world without us. So you can place a preferred item on the table or floor, say, what is that? And where is that? And after the child responds, remove the item and say, what, what happened to it? And the child says, it's gone, right? So all of these things can be randomized, can be interspersed, and they can be part of any activity that you do. You don't have to run the all gone program you can have a little protocol, collect a little data, 
And just as your team, your staff is engaging your learner away from the table, have them practice this because I, because I would rather a learner that I'm working with take three months to learn this, but then they, but then it's part of their uh, language repertoire. It's part of just what they're saying and doing, and we don't have to conduct a whole a, a, a whole bunch of uh, retention probes every two weeks, then once you know once every two weeks, and once every four weeks, and once a month for three months, and blah blah blah. Just let's just do it. Let's shape it up within the context of some activities and then let's just see how it goes over time. Now look, if it's not working, then the teaching procedure stinks. If you try everything that I'm recommending and you're like, ah, pff, none of that crap works, well, come up with something else. Then just do something else. Like look at your learner. What is your learner interested in? And like what 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 is going to get them to acquire the skill? Because it's not the learner's fault if they're not acquiring a skill, it's our fault for crappy teaching procedures, right? So I think that we can all agree on that. All right, let's talk about using no. So obviously, here's the easy thing. Offer something the child, ah, see, look, sorry, there's a little typo in my presentation. Anyway, you're gonna offer something to the child that you know that they do not like, something, that edib like something that's edible, something to drink, an activity, sensory, and you say, you know, oh, do you want the item? And then you put it very, very close to their nose or their mouth, if it's something like that. And as soon as they make a face, you prompt them to say no. And then you immediately take it away. And it's not gonna take a whole lot of trials of that, a whole lot of opportunities for the child to learn like, wow, when I say no, stuff I don't like goes away. Now, what's going to happen when this works? Kid's going to say no to everything. No, 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 no. Fine. Okay. You know what? Then um, that's just our job to do two things. One is to be more purposeful about randomizing things that they like with things that they don't like, right? And it's not just, you know, giving them a piece of broccoli and saying, do you want this versus giving them a cookie? I mean, you know, stuff can start there and I've done that, but I, I don't like doing that stuff anymore. I like doing things that I know that the child, like it's like mealtime. And as a general rule, we don't like doing specific teaching during mealtime because we run the risk of, you know, creating something that's aversive during mealtime. Believe me, someone always says that to me and that's fine, I get it. But you know what? If you have a kid that, that can actually sit at a table and eat with the family and not just run over to the table, take a piece of food and run away and they eat it and they come back and take a piece of food and they eat it and they run away and like that's the because that's not the way you're going to be able to teach them though. But if you are fortunate enough to have a learner that will sit and eat something, then you can run this. Just it doesn't you don't, you don't have to do it a hundred times. Just do it like you know a couple of times. The next night do it a couple of more times. Next day do it a couple of times. Then the day after that do it three or four more times. I mean, I feel pretty confident saying that your learner is probably going to figure it out. They may even figure it out as soon as they see you with something that they don't like. And then they're going to say no before you even have the opportunity to get it over to them. And now, isn't that interesting? Because now you're taking a learner that may have had, you know, while his language skills may be developing or their ability to use a communication device is developing, maybe they have some interfering behaviors, a self-stimulation, like they're flapping or whatever. Now they see you and they have a heightened awareness because you because they don't know what you're going to offer them, something good or something that they don't like. Because something good is awesome. Something they don't like, I say no, and Ray takes it away. Okay, well, you know, that's good too. So you target food, drinks, games, toys, and sensory. You know, there's a funny story. <clears throat> I've been working with this uh, young man for about, uh, I want to say, 17 years now. And um, he's, he's, <laughs> he's a great kid, I'm going to say that. But he uh, didn't talk when I first met him. Now he has the ability to converse at kind of a basic level. He's more focused on what he wants, obviously. But... Um, 
but we're continuing to uh, develop his language. But the, the way that I got him to say stop and no the very first time was basically just like roughhousing with him because, you know, no one, no, no one that had worked with him up until that point had done any roughhousing. And he liked it to a point. At some point, he just wanted it to stop. But he didn't really know how to say stop. He didn't really know how to say no. So pick him up, throw him over my shoulder, throw him on the couch, roughhousing, ha, 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 ha. You know, like the crazy uncle kind of roughhousing stuff and prompting him to say, no, stop, stop it, Ray. No, stop, stop. So, well, I mean, after a couple of, you know, after a few visits to the house, he just, he, it, it, like these were some of his uh, his first words were uh, were were stop it right I was like wow. I was like wow listen to that not only are we getting like like multiple words but it's pretty good articulation too and so and so by contriving that reflexive condition motivative operation was enough motivation for him to produce language for for literally the first time because contriving opportunities for him to request things that he wanted, eh, he really kind of like didn't care. He like kind of liked anything. So you know what, if he didn't get something, he would just go to something else. Like he was like, you know, like one of those kids, you know, like not particularly motivated, like, like he likes stuff, but he's not really gonna work for it. But if there's just a mild aversive stimulation, all of a sudden the language came out. So we were like, wow, this is great. This is super, super great. So um, anyway, could probably do a whole case study on, on him. But like I said, 17 years later, you know, he's doing really, I mean, you know, better than we had expected. Okay, next, while completing an activity. So here's a more advanced version. You can start this, this right here, number three, when you start teaching like puzzles and block imitation to young kids, like anything like that, because um, usually, and I'm gonna assume that you do kind of the same thing. When you start doing like block imitation or you're doing a puzzle, you're probably only giving the child the pieces that she needs, right? Only the pieces that she needs to complete the activity, which is fine because then the kid does it and then they stop then they contact reinforcement and everybody's happy, right? Everything's hunky-dory. But what if you add some other pieces? Does your learner try to put them in the puzzle? Does your learner just try to just keep struggling and struggling and then like have a meltdown? Or do they recognize that that piece is not part of what, of the activity that they're doing? So when you give them those other pieces, you can ask. Do you need this? But you have to wait for them to pick it up. So if they're doing a puzzle and they pick up like a piece from a different puzzle that happens to be there as a distractor and they look at it and then you've got to jump right in. Do, do you need that? And like that language probably won't mean anything. And then you prompt them to say, no, I don't need it or no, or use, use their device. And they say, no, on their device. And then you say, oh, okay, oh, must be to some other puzzle. And then you just, then, then you put it down. And yet don't do that 10 times in a row. You don't do that like again, like you wait until later in the session or later the next day to do that same thing. Because uh, again, you're using the power of the reflexive condition motivative operation to create a tiny little aversive situation that the learner's going to respond to uh, much faster than just, telling them, you know, do you need this? Say no, they say no, and then you give them a treat. You know, I, you know let's, let's, let's try to avoid that, right? So while completing an activity such as block play, boggle, or other multi-component activity present the piece that the child does not need. And that can happen anytime, anywhere. You're teaching a kid to set the table. Give them six extra forks. Do you need these? Kid says no. They say, okay, oh, well, I don't know where those extra forks came from. Let me, let me go and like put them away. I mean, it might sound silly, but, but, but it works. I mean, I've done it. I've like done all this stuff and believe me, it, it can be very effective. Okay, let's go to not event or not action. So let's fix a couple of things. 
There we go. So provide the child with an activity such as a shape sorter with most of the holes covered with construction paper and be sure to have at least one or two pieces that will not fit in any of the holes, right? Then you say, put the shapes in. Again, when the child's trying to put in a shape that does not fit, wait until they're getting just a little frustrated or if they're looking at the piece and they're trying to figure it out and then you prompt them to say, it doesn't fit or not fit or does not fit depending on the language level of your learner, right? It doesn't fit, does not fit. Teaching contractions versus the words separately, that's another whole separate discussion. I like to just teach contractions because that's what language sounds like. Um, but I have taught not fit, but, with, but I, the only time that I'll do those kinds of things is when I am collaborating with the speech pathologist and we're making sure that our long-term plan is we're going to teach these um, individual components of language with the goal of expanding them in a very specific way. So they may work on it a little differently than me and my team would, but it doesn't matter because we're all working towards the same goal. Because if the child can't say does not fit because maybe he can't say three words. So we're gonna just say not fit instead of does not fit or doesn't fit because the child's language is actually pretty good and we're all very comfortable teaching him to use contractions. Okay, some other, all right, some other examples. Toys with no batteries, not work. Shoes too big or small, not fit. A boring activity, not fun. Non-preferred activity, non-preferred event, not cleaning up, right? So you've been teaching your learner to clean up. And so like one day, just teach them to say, I don't want to clean up or not clean up or no clean up. Again, let me be specific. I only teach things that are not grammatically or syntactically correct when I'm collaborating with the speech pathologist, okay? Because um, sometimes like that language just gets like, I don't want it to become embedded in the child's repertoire. I want to target it, get it in place, expand it, and then get the child to use that. And then put these old forms like not clean up or not work on extinction and reinforce the new forms, the longer utterances that I am looking for that have more descriptive language. I mean, there's more that I, that I can say about that, but I'm sure that some of you are saying, why would you teach a kid to say not work or not fun or not cleaning up? Well, that's why, because it's part of a larger goal. He's not gonna walk around as an adult going, not work, all right? <laughs> We're not doing that. I'm not gonna teach a child to, to do that because obviously that would be weird. So obviously there's a bigger picture plan than just doing that. Okay, let's talk about I can't. Again, you provide the learner with an activity that is too difficult, right? And you say, do the activity, please. And once a learner is trying to do the action and they're having difficulty, prompt them to say, I can't. And you have to model the language in that tone of voice. But don't model, say, I can't, or say, I can't. Like, just let's stop with the therapeutic sounding, weird modeling of language. When you talk to your learners, talk to them the way you would talk to your own kid or, or your friend or, you know, well, not some of your friends, because I know how probably how you're talking to some of your friends, but talk to them in a regular tone of voice that's conversational. Okay, say, I can't. And you can even like model like, oh, I can't. And then they're looking at you doing that. And, you know, maybe they actually like, like they start doing that. I mean, wouldn't that just be wonderful? And you know why they're doing that? Because of all of the time that you took to teach generalized imitation a year ago when they were at that imitation level, right? Or two years ago. So this should then be paired with the learner asking for help. How many times are you trying to teach your learner to ask for help? And it just seems like you're constantly prompting. Do you need help? Say help help me, you know, and then the child says it, but they're just not doing it. Instead, they're, they're getting all frustrated and then they start acting out. So that's what I'm saying about mild 
aversive conditions, right? You, a mild reflexive condition motivative operation, not something that's gonna cause an explosion. So your timing has to be good. And when you're training your staff, you have to teach them to keep an eye on the child. Look, like look at them, they're like, uh, I'm looking right at the kid, right? I'm looking at, it. I'm watching like every single facial expression. I'm watching the eyes and, the, and like any little twitch, any precursor behavior that might be happening, I'm gonna jump in and tell them say, I can't. And then they say, I can't. And they say, oh, okay, well, um, uh, say, can you help me? Or say help. And then they say help. And you're like, oh, all right, not a problem, pal. Here, give me five, all right, give them a couple squeezes, a little pat on the back, let me help you with this. And then the two of you do the activity together. All right, I'm gonna put this piece in here, right? You, you wanna put that piece in? That's the way I like to talk to kids. I don't care whether they can understand me or not. I'm not thinking, gee, I mean, he's not at a language level where he's understanding all this stuff that I'm saying. Don't care, I'm talking to the child like he's a child, like he's a kid. Hey pal, come here, all right, look, you having a tough time? I'm gonna help you, nice say it help, give me five. All right, let's figure this out. And then we just sit there and we do it together. Right, makes sense, treating kids like kids. For very young children, prompting I can't without them asking for help can be sufficient. Right, so the adult should just offer the help. Then the adult and the child should just complete the task together. But again, the critical element is the timing of your prompt, right? You can't just say, here's our teaching procedure, you're going to do this thing and you're gonna cover up this and you're gonna do that. And as soon as like he can't do it, jump in and say, and like prompt him to say, I can't. No, you have to wait for some, uh, just a tiny little bit of emotional responding and then you prompt. That's the critical element, all right? Then you prompt, that's the critical element. A little bit of emotional responding because that's how the kid understands it. It's like, oh, I'm having this feeling. This is the language that goes along with that feeling, right? Okay, I don't know, okay. So it's just about seven o'clock. So before we start, I don't know, I'm going to give you your next keyword, keyword time. So if you're watching this, trying to get some CEUs, here's your second keyword, persistence. Persistence is your next keyword, right? Because that's what this job is all about. We have to just keep going and keep figuring stuff out and keep hammering it out and keep analyzing and keep changing procedures and keep uh, just persist in modifying reinforcement schedules and reinforcers and making sure that we actually have reinforcers and not just some crap that we're giving as a reward because we think that the kid likes it because you know your staff might not fully understand, but I know that you know that a reinforcer is not a reinforcer sometimes because it does not have any effect on the learner's behavior. It does not have any effect on the future probability of a behavior occurring again in the future under similar conditions, right? Okay, enough of that. So I don't know. You can place four picture cards. So here's what I like to do during discrete trial training. You place four picture cards in a linear array. Three of the pictures the learner should be able to label and the fourth should be unknown. It doesn't always have to be in the fourth position. It should be randomized. Sometimes it's in the first position, sometimes it's in the last, et cetera, because you can't have it in the fourth position every time because otherwise the kid will just say, I don't know to whatever is in the last position instead of actually learning how to say, I don't know. Three of the cards he can label. So you say, what's this? He says, car. What's that? He says, house. What's this? He's like, and you, and you just don't look at him and don't tell him to say, you just go, I don't know. And I, it's, I feel comfortable saying that the kid's probably gonna say, I don't know. And then you just go on to the next picture, right? And then you say, what's this? And the kid says, tiger. And they're like, wow, that was awesome. Give me five, because you're not gonna teach that picture yet. But before you start doing that, you have to collect a lot of pictures of things that you, that you know 
that the child does not know how to label or of things that even though he like he may know what a lamp is but he but but you know you have a subscription to architectural digest or something and there's some bizarre looking lamp and so you cut that picture out and you use that in your array you have to collect stimuli that the child does not know you have to walk around the kid's house find things that you know that he cannot label and practice his program if he's in a school-based program, you have to find things in the classroom, in the hallway, wherever. Again, if they ever go back to school, um, that he does not know, right? And you reinforce, I don't know, not with a treat, but by moving on to the next item. Later, you can test for acquisition of a new label by saying, you know, you do the array thing, four or five things, what's this, he labels it, what's that, he labels it, what's this, he labels it, what's that, he says, I don't know. And then you say, oh, it's a guitar pick. You know, and so kid probably doesn't know what the guitar pick is, so, but they can put it away after that one exposure. And you pull it out the next day and you show it to your learner and you say, what's this? Does he give him a good five to seven seconds to try to answer? Okay. And if he can, that's fantastic. He's bordering on being a one trial learner, right? And that's, I mean, it's all, that's a whole other topic, but that is just amazing. If you can go from, I don't know, to showing it once and then bring it out the next day. Hey, do you remember what this is? What's this? And he says, guitar pick. You're like, wow. That's really impressive. That is exactly what we're looking for. That is exactly the kind of learning that's going to get a kid to that place that we talked about when we first started, where they have a label for everything. Okay. You can um, use social questions, intersperse asking the learner questions for, for more advanced kids, intersperse asking the learner questions that they know versus questions that they don't know the answer to. So that, so, you know, what's your name? What's your address? What's your mom's name? Hey, um, what color is John's house? Kid's never been to John's house. You know, he just knows that John's one of the instructors, right? He has no idea <laughs> anything about John's bizarre life, right? So he says, I don't know. Here's something else about teaching I don't know. It's a little risky to do, but I like to try to do it. With some kids, you can teach them, I don't know. But don't go like this, I don't know. You know, because, <laughs> because, because some kids will imitate that and then it'll just look weird. So you just say, you know, you know I don't know, just, shrug, just shrug your shoulders and just like raise your hands up a little bit. I don't know. Because so many of our kids don't use gestures. Like it's something that, um, that we, uh, that we teach so infrequently, like even though you can't see, can't see like everything that I'm doing, but I like talk with my hands constantly, hands are constantly going, right? So I'm like, this gesture is like all over the place. Like I can't even have a conversation without waving my hands around like a nut. So I try to teach some of the gestures. Some kids, some, uh, you know, some, some kids I think, you know, like I'm not going to be doing that, but others I definitely teach the gestures. Um, so social questions, intersperse what they know with what they don't know, I don't know, and then the reinforcer is just going on. Because you can use that answer, I don't know, because there's a whole other protocol called getting and giving information where I don't know is the prerequisite to that, where now they get the information or they go and get it from somebody else. Like you say something like, um, hey, uh, how long does it take to get to the car wash from here? Kids are like, I don't know. He, you know, he doesn't know how long it takes to get there. He's not driving, you know, he's seven. So I said, go ask mom. And then he has to go find his mother and he says, uh, how long does it take to get to the car wash? Mom says, 10 minutes. So then he comes back and you say, oh, so what did mom say? He says, 10 minutes. Oh, awesome, wow, great, okay, perfect. So, but I don't, so I don't know is a jumping off point for some like other higher level programming. Okay, a blank can't action. 
So can a blank action? A blank can't action. Or no, a blank can't action. So the early learner example, like can a cat say moo, right? They master their animal sounds and then you ask them, can a cat say moo? An advanced learner might be saying, you know, hey, can a hammer wash the dishes? And that just sounds silly. And the child says, no, oh, no, the hammer can't wash the dishes. But, you know, but what's more natural is you're out in public or you're doing something and you say, hey, do you think that that train can get us to, to the museum? And the child says, no, it can't. Or, you know, it's probably for like someone older. I just use that as an example for a more advanced, for, for more advanced learner. The, the focus should not always be on just these positive responses. Um, we, I, again, I feel strongly that even though it takes a long time to teach some of these responses to some of our kids, the long-term value is their language sounds so much more natural. It <clears throat> just sounds like, like they're talking like everybody else. Okay. Did you blank? I didn't blank. Okay, so you can start with a very salient example for the learner like put a toy car on the floor and push it. Then ask, did you push the car? And you're probably gonna say, I didn't, I didn't push the car, right? And again, that's the way you're gonna model it. You're gonna say, did, did you push that car? And, again, and you probably, uh, I didn't push the car. What, what's even better is if the child has siblings or maybe there's a kid in the class that maybe um, you know, can be the um, model, be like the third person model for that kind of teaching. Right, so you do it with the peer or the sibling or even the parent, and then you do it with the child to see if they have some like third person imitation. They can acquire skill from looking at somebody else do something, which is so critical for higher level kids. They have to be able to see, to observe the consequences that other people um, Re receive and then regulate their behavior based on what they're seeing somebody what's happening to somebody else whether it's good or bad right so just something to like keep in mind again that's like a whole a whole workshop in itself to like talk about how to teach that um during conversation practice after the learner offers a specific response say did you say you know so if uh, you know so if you say hey um hey, i forgot when your birthday was when's your birthday and say September 17th. Oh, all right, uh, wait a second. Did, did you say October 17th? And they say, no, September 17th, right? So they're clarifying their answer. They're, it's, it's all part of the same negation form. So an advanced version, pretend to break something or drop something when the learner's not looking at it and then ask, did you break this? And they say, oh, no, I didn't break that, right? They point, they're gonna point to the cat. <laughs> you know, they're gonna point to, to their dog. See, like all of the, and like all of these things, I mean, they may sound silly. I don't know if they like sound ridiculous to you, but um, I really think it is incredibly important, not only for the child's language to sound natural, but when you do with the language, with the gesture, under the conditions under which they may actually use it. I mean, like they, they just, um, like I think that they engage more, like at a, at a different level when they're um, at a little bit of a heightened emotional uh, level and they're acquiring this kind of language. And I think it can be fun for staff to uh, do some of this stuff because it's not just, oh, we're gonna, you know, yeah, we're gonna run our blah, blah, blah program and then we're gonna go on the floor and we're gonna play hi-ho cherry-o and you know, just, what you know, because like the staff gets bored with that stuff too. And I know that you know that because your staff has their favorite programs, right? Because if you had everybody write down what programs they, they, they ran each day, which you probably should be doing, you could see and there's a couple of your instructors always run these two or three programs regardless of how many times they were run that week, you know? So anyway, do versus don't. Um, so you say action, you say clap, learner claps, you say, wow, oh, great. Then you say, don't clap, okay? But now don't, has to be a response. This is the response that I, that I like for don't. The kid folds their hands in, in their lap and then just, just closes their mouth. So it's, it's like a neutral position. And then um, you can also have them practice it from standing. They have their hands in their pockets or, or they put their hands at their sides and they just, and they just close their mouths. So you say, um, you know, jump, don't jump. And then they go into their new, their new, new uh, neutral position. Um, 
a long time ago, I used this instead of this behavior plan because um, <clears throat> I was working with a learner for whatever reason, he um, found, he, he thought screaming was fun. <laughs> he, I mean, he wasn't screaming because he was upset. I think that he probably screamed a few times and, you know, his, uh, you know, his parents came running out of like, and they're like, oh my God, what's wrong? Blah, 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 blah. And so I think it got inadvertently shaped up as some kind of attention seeking behavior. Okay. So we did, we taught him to respond to the instruction, scream, scream. And he'd go, ah, and then we say, don't scream. And then he, oh, all right. So now, so now his mom, when he was screaming, would just say, don't scream. And then he would, and then he'd go into his neutral position. And then she would not only catch him being a pro, well, I'm sorry. Then she would provide him with a tremendous amount of social praise for responding that way. And then she was very purposeful in catching him not screaming and saying, I love the way you're being quiet. I love the way you're sitting with your sister. I love the way you're playing with your, that's so fantastic. And so she was like so incredibly diligent at catching him being appropriate that after a short period of time, he just, he just stopped screaming for attention because his mom was just giving him all this non-contingent attention. And uh, you know, we, so we worked together to start to fade some of that stuff back. But I think that it was so valuable that it actually strengthened the relationship be, be between the mom and, and the son because the son like started following mom around, which he had never done before. He was you know, always seeking her out as a source of like comfort. And then when he started to have a good uh, manding repertoire, he would go right over to her. He wouldn't talk to anybody else, which both you know, presented like its own challenges, et cetera. But, um, but anyway, scream, don't scream. That was the extent of, uh, of the intervention and then mom delivering um, a very dense schedule of non-contingent attention. Okay, so um, here's a little variation that you can do with using yes and no. You, um, so, so here's a young man named Danny. I presented Danny with an array of three to five pictures and I'd say, what do I have? And then he would label everything that was in front of me. And then I would say, do I have a, a, like a car? And there would not be a picture of a car and he would say yes or no. And um, we, we like took, took him through a couple of different phases and then eventually um, we um, had him set up where I had pictures and he had pictures. What do you have? What do I have? Do you have a blank? And then we take everything away. Did you have it? And now he can say, no, I didn't have it or, or um, no, you, you didn't have it or I don't have it. And so it was a little bit of a roundabout way of getting to what I really wanted him to say, but he just wasn't responding to some of the other teaching uh, that we were doing. And again, like I said earlier, because a kid's not learning something doesn't mean that they can't learn it. It just means that we stink at teaching it. And I said to his mom, I said, you know what? I think I stink at teaching this particular skill. Let me, uh, let me uh, call a couple of colleagues that are a lot smarter than I am and like run this by them and like see what they think. Okay, so um, let's go through some exclusions. And um, so here's is versus isn't. And I outlined all of this stuff. This comes like right out of the LOVAS curriculum. So everything's here for you. Here's the SD, here's the response, here are your prerequisite skills. And then, then it says mastery, the M is for mastery. And, the, and it's not considered mastery until generalization to, to novel items or generalization to isn't, all right? So generalized responding is the goal, not just 80 to 100% across three consecutive instructors or sessions, blah, blah, blah. So you have is or isn't an object label, is or isn't a category plus an attribute, right? Which one is um, not an animal that flies? Okay, um, then you have your what doesn't belong protocol, right? The therapist puts a row of items out on the table or floor. One doesn't belong in the same category. So obviously he has to have mastered and generalized his categories. Uh, the child points to or names the item. And um, they, they, well, I mean, obviously this, it's not that they may need to be taught, but they're probably going to need to, to, uh, to, to be taught that. And then you ask them what doesn't belong. Again, therapist puts rows of items out on the table. Uh, something doesn't belong. What, what doesn't belong? They uh, point to it or name it. And then you ask them, well, why or why not? And they say, because it's not, you know, it's not a furniture or because it's not blue or because it doesn't have four sides, et cetera. 
you know, so that's the kind of thing where you can um, program based on the complexity of the other skills that your, um, that, that your child, that your learner has acquired. So some simple categories, name something that's not an animal, see something. So it could be anything. So name, name something that's, that's, that's not an animal. I don't know. I'm just looking around the room. I mean, it could be a cell phone. It could be a picture card. It could be a fan. It could be, a, you know, like a light switch, anything. I think, you, I think you'd find it surprising to see that uh, kids have a lot of difficulty at first because this, this is the kind of thing where you don't just give them the answer. See, here's another thing about this level of programming. You try not to just give the kid the answer, right? You try to guide them to, to the answer. So, and it can be as simple as, okay, tell me something that's not a furniture. And they're like, hmm. And you're like, well, I mean, is, is this a furniture? And it's like, no. Okay, well, is, is this a furniture? No. Well, is this a furniture? The kid's like, well, I don't even know what that thing is. <laughs> right? so, so, so it's just like giving him the idea that it can be anything. It, it can be anything. Um, a simple attribute. Name something that's not blue. Name something that's not hot. Name something that's not, you know, that's not red. So all things that you actually can program at the table, introduce at the table, but then like just bring it up in like conversation so that it sounds a little more natural, right? Because you're gonna teach, name something that's not blue, right? Because then that just sounds like the kid's supposed to be telling you something, right? So he says, uh, he says a tomato. All right, so you say, wow, that's right. That tomato is not blue. Well, what color is it? it it's red. Oh, do you know where, you know, what like tomatoes grow on? And, and he doesn't know. So you say a vine. Maybe you go to YouTube, you show him a picture, you show him a video, you talk about it. So that's how you start to shape up some of that stuff. Anyway, um, again, trying to incorporate that outside of uh, the teaching table, but giving them the idea at the table. Some uh, subcategories, like name something that's category, attribute, or function that's not an object, right? So, um, so tell me uh, an animal that um, doesn't fly that's not a tiger. So then something that's a little more advanced, tell me something you wouldn't or you know, couldn't uh, do, right? Like, like something you couldn't do on a hot day, do on Saturday, say in a restaurant where or where to school, okay. Let's get through some um, verb tenses. So I'm gonna just uh, map out the sequence for you, and then what I'm gonna do when you get your when you get your certificate is I will email this to you as well. So you'll get the PowerPoint. Plus I'm gonna email this like corresponding set of programs for you as well. Most of it you probably know, which is fine, but I think that you should just have it as like a separate document just at your disposal because we all know that not every single one of our kids has to go through every single step, but you have to know what every single step is so you can skip steps, like go ahead and then probe backwards and make sure that you're not um, missing skills. Okay present, past, and future tenses. So here, excuse me, are um, receptive action labels, right? Kind of a format that everybody's familiar with. You present the learner with a field of pictures of people performing actions, and you say, you know, touch, touch the action verb. And the child touches the correct one. Great, perfect. So then, that goes into expressive action labels or tacting, whatever I was taught to use receptive and expressive. I know you may frown upon that, but what can I do? All right, so receptive action labels and expressive action labels, right? You show the child the picture card. What is the boy, girl, man, woman, baby doing? And they tell you the action plus ing. Now, at the same time that you're doing that, you can start doing receptive action labels as in, in books. So now you can, again, not do it at the table, not have 500 retention probes running every single month and blah, and a maintenance book and blah. Cause like, look, if you have to do all of that just to get your learner to retain some information, um, a couple of challenges is probably the, the learner has some remembering challenges or just, it's not just under the tight enough stimulus control, but, um, it didn't get masked, it, it didn't get generalized as part of mastery, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, take the receptive action labels. And of course, you're doing multiple exemplar training, right? You're not just using um, 
like this set of actions because it's an easy trap to fall into. You you like teach kid every action in that. And, um, you know, it's not enough. Kids need like 75 or 80 actions and multiple examples and pictures and videos and magazines and books and movies. Anyway, receptive action labels goes into receptive book actions and simultaneously you're running expressive action labels. Now you're running action identification. So, so here's the next cluster, instructor actions and expressive book actions. So let's see. So receptive book actions, the instructor presents a learner with a page from a book and says, touch jumping, right? there, or, or you can make it more natural sounding and you can say, show me the character that's jumping. Show me the one that's climbing the tree. Action identification, what is person doing? Person is present tense action, right? Instructor actions, which is right here again, the instructor performs an action and says, what am I doing? And now here's where I've actually seen people make this mistake. I've seen this, people do this to a kid. What am I doing? Well, you're not doing anything actually. You're asking me a question. <laughs> you're, 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 what you're actually doing is saying, what am I doing? You have to keep the action going while you're asking, what am I doing? And it gives the kid an opportunity to not only um, say the answer, but probably what they're not familiar with is you performing actions and they're talking because usually you do something and then stop and then wait for them to answer, right? So, you know, that's why, again, when you do stuff at the table and then on the floor in the natural environment and you're contriving opportunities uh, just as often as you're teaching at the table, these little technical things like that don't become issues. Okay, you're moving from the receptive book actions to expressive book actions. Then your next cluster is the receptive, I'm sorry, reversed action identification, child actions, and of course you have to generalize across media. So expressive book actions, the instructor presents the learner with a page from a book and says, what is he or she doing, right? Easy, because you're probably already doing that. But now here's this form, who's actioning? Who's running? Who's jumping? And I prefer kids to say the, the name, if they know the name of the character or the, or, or the person. And if they don't, they should say the man, the woman, the boy, the girl, the baby. Because there are some other programming that goes along with that later on that we're not going to talk about tonight. Okay, so now from receptive action labels, you can follow this line all the way around to receptive present progressive action ID. So now... What does that look like? Okay, so it's just the, you're saying, touch finder, give me, the girl is jumping, right? You're saying a full sentence. And then later the response is the full sentence. And if the child has mastered some pronouns, they can use he or she. If your learner has not mastered pronouns, use boy, girl, man, woman, baby, in the full sentence answer. And now you have to be careful with the present progressive tense because you wind up, if you don't intersperse it with other programs that just require a single word response, you're gonna wind up inadvertently teaching the child to always talk in full sentences. And that's weird, right? So we just have to, again, you introduce this very tightly, here's what I'm asking, here's the kind of response that I expect, but then it all has to get real loose real quick, right? Other, so that way they're a little more flexible and you differentially reinforce full sentence responding in this program versus when they respond correctly, but they didn't use a full sentence, right? Differentially reinforce, more reinforcement for the full sentence, less reinforcement or not as good quality reinforcement for not a full sentence. Right, we talked about the expressive present progressive action ID, right? So then is when we start introducing our past tense verbs. Go and went should, should be the first one. So really the prerequisite that they have to have are room labels. And if you're teaching in a school, they should know different parts of the classroom, right? They should know where, you know, whatever station is in, in your classroom. And they say, you know, go to the, uh, I almost said the chalkboard, but who has a chalkboard anymore? Go to the smart board, 
all right, uh, you know, they say make a line or whatever. You know, you tell them to do something with the smart board. Kid uh, comes back in, comes back over to you and you say, oh, so where did you go? And he says, I went to the smart board. Okay, now at the same time, you're taking these same pictures and you're following this line all the way down to past tense to deregular. And this is exactly what I was talking about before. This is what you're gonna do. Now, let's start with a regular past tense verb. What is the girl doing? So clapping, or the girl is clapping. And then you just take the picture away and say, what did the girl do? And you teach a learner to say clapped, or the girl clapped, okay? It's simple, right? But that's one of those teach one and probe for generalization type programs because I don't want you to have to teach 75 regular past tense verbs because that's really not what happens. You know, I would rather your child make errors because it's the irregular past tense verbs that they're just gonna have to kind of memorize, but they can just try to figure out these verbs, these regular past tense verbs that you introduce them to a couple with an ED ending and then they figure out, oh, ED is the way that it's supposed to end. And then when you introduce the irregular past tense verbs, they start making some, uh, some little errors, but they start to figure it out over time and as you differentially reinforce what verbs are regular past tense verbs and what, and what verbs are irregular past tense verbs that require a specific response versus just changing the form of the verb to having an ED ending. So now you're basically running through the same sequence that we just discussed, but all in past tense. So here's your regular past tense instructor actions where you're saying, you know, so now you can do this. So what am I doing? Child says clapping. You say, wow, that's great. What did I do? He says, you clapped. Fantastic, excellent. And then you do past tense book actions where simultaneously because you're reading a story, you're showing them a picture in a book. What is so-and-so doing? Close the book. So, so, wh so what did so-and-so do? Tell me what so-and-so did. Try to make it sound a little natural when you're doing that. Again, your regular past tense child actions, right? You're not doing irregular past tense verbs with it. You're asking the child to perform some action and then you are asking them, what did they do? Simultaneously, you're taking this regular past tense book actions program and you're generalizing across media, right? Okay. Okay, now some regular past tense book actions. We follow the line, you get irregular past tense book actions and you kind of want to get some past tense two-dimensional irregular under the kid's belt first, right? And you see that how the boxes kind of overlap. So I did that intentionally because you can be running them simultaneously. It may cause some discrimination errors, but you know what? I like it when kids figure stuff out. As much as I'm all for like errorless teaching, there comes a time where kids have to start figuring things out, making mistakes, having opportunities, you're differentially reinforcing their responses, they're figuring things out for themselves, and then responding to the surprise of reinforcement. And you will be amazed at how those skills taught and acquired under those conditions generalize so much easier irregular past tense instructor actions, right? So like the same thing, I know it seems like very confusing. So we have, let's just catch up to where we are. Irregular past tense instructor actions, what am I doing? Then SD2, you uh, perform the action, you say, what did I do, et cetera? And here are your prerequisite skills. And of course, mastery is generalization, not 80 to 100% across three consecutive sessions and two instructors and a blah, you know, whatever. It's generalized responding, right? So you're teaching one and then probing for generalization. Child does not demonstrate the skill during the probe for generalization. Pick one more response, teach it. Probe for generalization. And you keep teaching and probing for generalization. Teach and probe for generalization until the child can perform the action, right? Until he can perform the response. That's what we're looking for, generalized responding because we're building a conversational language repertoire. We're not just teaching a bunch of responses 
because it's in his book, because it's in his program. No, we're, te we're, we're building the uh, foundation for a conversation. Irregular past tense child actions. Same thing. Now you're telling the child to do something and they do it. What are you doing? I'm, I'm blanking. What did you do? I blanked. There you go. Good. Again, teach one, pro for generalization. And keep doing that until the child has actually acquired the skill, generalized. Now you are taking your irregular past tense book actions and you're following this line, mixed regular and irregular book actions. Okay, I mean, it's exactly what it says. You're just taking both regular and irregular past tense forms. And as you're reading a book and talking to your learner about it and asking them questions, they are interspersing um, the, um, the appropriate responses. Now, just going to go, go, go through this quickly because you're just going to have it. I mean, I'm going to send all, all of this stuff to you if you're getting your CEUs. Now we're going to start future tense, which is basically um, the same sequence just with future tense verbs, a similar sequence, right? We start future tense um, from go went, you can start go went plus, plus action. So go here, perform this action. What are you going to do? Where are you going to go? Okay. Now, and, and the child says, I'm going to. What are you going to do? I'm going to make a line on the board. Where are you going? I'm going to the smart board. You say, oh, okay, good. All right, well, go do it. And when he comes back, you're going to say, where did you go? What did you do? Why did you do it? He says, because you told me to. <laughs> okay, so Let's keep going. So then you have double past tense, regular and irregular where you're at, you're having multiple actions and things all happening simultaneously, right? I want you to go here and do this and then go there and do that. Where, where are you going to go? I'm going to go here and here. And what are you going to do? I'm going to do this and that. And then when they come back, you ask them again, where did you go? What did you do? And they should tell you all five or six bits of information, right? The four actions you told them to perform and the two locations that they were supposed to go to. Because now you're not only working on um, like your verb tense forms, you're actually starting to put some of that foundation for some of that remembering protocol in place. So then you do verbal trips. So verbal trips, it's a funny name, but it's basically this, go to room action and action. Where, where, so where did you go? I went to the, to the location. What did you do? And then they intersperse the regular and here, irregular past tense verbs. But then you have to do the nonverbal trips, which comes here, where you just take the learner around the house or around the classroom and you do a bunch of stuff. And then you ask them, where did we go? What did we do? What did I do? What did you do? Did you do that in that room? And so it, 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 it just starts with where did we go and what did we do? But you're not telling the child where you're going and what you're doing, you're just doing it. Because again, you're, you're not only using past, uh, I'm sorry, the future tense verbs, you're setting the foundation for the whole remembering protocol, which will come um, a little bit later on. Okay. Mixed tense, you're randomizing instructions followed by SDs that evoke a past tense verb or use of the future tense. And of course, like I've been saying all night, this program should be practiced away from the table and in the, in the natural environment. Okay, then you get into the program of what happened. That's quite a creative name for a program, but it's just that. So it, you perform some action, you stop, you wait a few seconds, and then you say, uh, what happened? And the kid says, oh, you clapped, you fell on the floor, you, you, know, you kicked the ball. So it's not just that some discrete event he's attending to and then he tells you, like you have to wait a little bit. And the goal is that you begin with one action, maybe you go to multiple actions, but later on, you systematically increase the time delay so where the child sees you do something, let's say like you, um, like you say, hey, Junior, come on over here. And you, and you, you know, show them a tomato and it sounds silly, but, but, I, I, but I actually did this once and I just took a fork and stuck it in the tomato. And then I took the kid back to uh, like a different room, waited like 10, 15 minutes. And I said, uh, what happened in the kitchen? 
because it was such an unusual event for him that he actually remembered. He didn't remember how to say it all correctly, but he got his point across. He had tomato and fork and in, and it was some mixture of like words in there, but I was like so, so proud of him because I was like, wow, that was really good because that was the first time that I tried doing that with that, uh, with that particular learner. Okay, so then next you have some community trips, right? Because now you can take your learner out into the community, perform several distinct actions, and upon returning, ask them about what happened on the trip. You see how we're kind of building all of that remembering foundation now? It's not quite the remembering programming, but it's the prerequisite skills. Okay, so next we have the TV recall where they're watching a show and then you're asking them questions. What are they going to do? What did they do? Um, what should they do, et cetera? And then you generalize recall and description of events to the natural environment and for longer periods of time. So that whole sequence, so I've just outlined all right here for you. And like I said, I will send that all to you when you get your um, certificate. Okay, very close to wrapping it up. Let's talk about describing, okay? So, you say, tell me about a horse. And the child should give you like, you know, three, three descriptors. It usually starts and you, and you can show them the picture. Um, and then eventually you fade the pictures out. But it usually starts with like, it's a whole, uh, you know, he's brown, he has four legs, he says nay. Like kind of like some basic information. As your learner acquires more skills, the descriptions should be more abstract. So tell me about a horse. Oh, they, uh, you know, they uh, run, they run on the beach with their friends, cowboys ride them, and uh, I don't know, and like some other description. You know, like, like I see, you know, daddy bets on them at the track, something like that. So, so the more um, language that your child has, the more advanced the descriptors should be. But in general, as, an, as a general format, you will begin with objects or pictures that the learner can see using sentence types which have been previously mastered in separate drills, okay? Then do objects the learner can't see, then have the learner describe people and places. So now you're starting, I hope you're starting to get the idea how all of this kind of fits together, right? Because it doesn't really matter if a child can like describe like a horse. I mean, it's good. It's, it's more of like an exercise for us to make sure that they have that particular kind of skill. But if you say, all right, well, you know what, tell, tell me about mom. Tell me about Disney World. Tell me about uh, dad's car. You know, tell me about your friend's bedroom, you know, your, or, or like the playroom. Or tell me about the um, uh, movie that you went to. Like, what was the movie theater like? You know, so all of this stuff has to kind of like fit together, but it starts very simply and this kind of programming would stay in place for a long time, most likely, because you want to keep expanding it and expanding it until it's just like you're coming into the house and you're having a little conversation with your learner. You know, hey, how's it going today? Good. How are you? And you say, like, oh, you know, let me, let me tell you, I was stuck in a little bit of traffic coming over here and and you know, and if the kid doesn't know what traffic is, look, now you have an amazing opportunity to show some videos, to talk about it, to ask some questions, build a little lesson around it, you know, be, because kids should like know that stuff. Because it's, because think about it. What does the learner that you're teaching know about you? And, you know, and I feel strongly, that's one of the reasons why when people do conversation training, it's a million questions. Like we ask kids a million questions. So. So what'd you have for breakfast? What'd you do? What'd you do after that? And then what did you do? Who did you see? Where did you go? Why blah, 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 blah. And the kids just answering, answering, answering. And it's not enough to just teach them to ask some questions within the context of that conversation. They need all of this stuff in order to hold up their end of the conversation. They need a lot of other skills, but they need this too, right? So anyway. Um, you have the learner describe people, describe places, and then your prompts for the program can be textual or verbal. And initially have the learner respond with one sentence, then two, then three. And once she meets criteria, like I said, you increase the response requirement, three sentences, more descriptive language, 
and then you're adding past tense, future tense, you know, um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, into the program. Okay, some comments on learning to describe. As soon as a learner can label items, randomize ESDs. What is it? What's this? What's this called? Tell me what this is. Place a picture object at the far end of the table, point to it and say, hey, what's that? And it has to sound like that. What's that? What's, what's that thing over there? Do you know what that is? Because that's the way that they're going to experience language when they're not around us. But if everything that you say to them sounds like this, what's that? What is this? What's this called? Like no, like no one talks like that but you, so stop it. As soon as the learner acquires colors, randomize the SDs. What color? What color is it? Tell me the color. What's that color? And then the previous two should um, make the acquisition of what is it versus what color a lot easier, right? So you show them, you, so you show your learner the clicker. So what's that? The clicker. What color? It's orange. What other color is it? It's black. What's it for? For clicking. So how do you click it? You push the button. Tell me something that has a button, a clicker. So, you know, those are, that's just like drilling to make sure that they can do it. But then you talk about what you do with the clicker. Like, hey, I was a clicker training my dog the other day. I'm like, oh, what's your dog's name? Oh, well, they just asked a question. See, they don't know what, what my dog's ne you know, name is. And so anyway, you see what I'm trying to get at. Let's go back here, sorry. If your learner has mastered the reciprocal conversation program, you can run this reciprocal describe protocol. I'm just going to describe it to you because we only have a few more minutes. <clears throat> so you put a picture in front of you, you put a picture in front of the learner. You say, mine's orange. He says, mine's blue. Mine's a vehicle. Mine's a furniture. Uh, you know, mine's for driving. Mine's for sitting. So you can say, oh, so then after you've done that, that you say, well, Mine's um, a vehicle, it's for driving, and it's orange. And then they give the same three to three descriptors. You can even do it with a third person if, um, if you want. So I put the whole procedure in here for you. But the reciprocal describe program for kids that don't do well for whatever reason with the other, you know, tell me about the blank um, kind of thing, this works sometimes better because it's more like a game. You know, it's more interesting. And you can even do it with games. Okay, so there's that whole protocol. There are your describe options. And now guessing is the last thing that I'm gonna talk about. Because guessing is just an extension of the describe program, right? All the variations of describe could be applied to the guess protocol. And guessing just starts like this. I'm thinking of something, it's brown, it has four legs and says, nay, what is it? Kid says, it's a horse. Okay, well, I mean, that's the most basic form of that program, but it has to go well beyond that, okay? Because if a child can do that, even generalized, while that's good, that's just, you know, they're just mediocre at best that um, they can do. It's okay in the grand scheme of getting to conversational abilities. And again, I'm going to say that it doesn't matter if your learner is vocal or uses an augmentative communication device. Here's why I argue with my speech pathologist colleagues. I think when a learner that uses an augmentative communication device is in an ABA program, is doing this kind of intensive teaching, all the responding should be on the device. Because if the learner could talk, they would be talking all of their, <laughs> all of their responses. And since the talker is the form of talking, that's how they should respond. That, that's how they should be responding. And you know, at a lot of my speech pathologists, colleagues and I, we just agree to disagree on that one point, but I love them anyway. Okay, so I'm thinking of something, what is it? It's an object, mastery of non-visual SDs and attempts to respond to novel SDs. That's what you want, novel responding. Hey, I'm thinking of something, it's black. And um, when I use my computer, if I push a button, um, paper with words come out of it. So what is it? Oh, it's probably the printer. You know, maybe he knows that, maybe he doesn't. But I'm just the best example I can think of right now. Please avoid any road teaching. Don't have on your data sheet 50 things that the kids mastered 
at, in this guess format. No, teach one and probe for generalization. They don't meet criteria during the probe, teach another one and probe for generalization. They don't meet criteria during the probe, teach the next one and probe for generalization. That's all that you have to do. And you keep doing it and doing it and doing it. As your learner gets better at responding and guessing, increase the complexity and abstractness of the descriptors. Once the learner has mastered and generalized the basic format, expand the SDs to previous events, possibly an extension of the go went or verbal and nonverbal trips program. Like I like you say, you know, hey, I'm thinking of a place that, you know, that we went and it had food and it had a cashier and it was it was huge and a big parking lot. Where where did we go? Because it's oh Whole Foods, something like that. Next, once a learner has mastered and generalized the extension of these programs, you can generalize the response to, remember when we went to that place that was huge with a parking lot and we had lots of food and there was a cashier there and we got some, some chocolate and some bread and all the stuff that we're not supposed to eat. And the kid's like, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> that, that, like, that was a supermarket. And this program component can be taught simultaneously within the real world language program, which is like a whole separate protocol where when you're taking kids out, then you bring them back, you, um, you know, you guide them through telling the whole story to you about the little outing that you had, and then you wait a certain period of time and then you tell it, then you have them tell it to one of their parents. Okay. It is time for the last key word, and I really appreciate you sticking with me the whole time and um, being interested in this topic, okay? So your last key word is CMO-T, right? Standing for Condition Motivative Operation of the Transitive Type, right? CMOT. That's your third key word. So if you are getting CEUs for this tonight, then you have to email those three key words to me, ray at abaskills.com, and um, I will make sure you get your certificate, that you get a copy of the PowerPoint, and I will also make sure that you get this um, set of verb tense program list as well. And that's it. So All right, up? Ray, thank you so much. That was a really great presentation. I really appreciate it. I know everyone who has been watching really appreciates it. Um, I just, I, I think that you provide such clear direction on language training that can sometimes be seen as just like a big knotty web, you know, and, and it really helps to clarify going from these skills to these skills to these skills and, and moving on in this flow chart fashion to see how everything connects. And I think that these presentations do such a great job of showing us, you know, you don't just get there um, by like probing it and seeing, oh, they didn't master that skill or they don't have that skill yet, but that we have to like really identify all of these many, many prerequisite skills before we get to that place. So a couple of questions are, um, do we need to have a learner master a target at the table first and then probe for generalization? Because it sounds like you're saying we can teach in vivo often that just, you know, we can teach in the natural environment. Um, and I, I think there's, um, there's a tradition of teaching at the table first. So what do you think about that? Um, I think that, I have a strong preference for teaching in the natural environment, for introducing skills at the table and then moving away from the table. Certainly there are some kids, maybe due to some behavioral challenges, we as instructors have better instructional control sitting at the table, so we may keep them there longer, but that just means we need to focus more on some of those behavioral challenges before we can work on some of these other things, or prioritize, rather, some of the behavioral challenges while working on some of these other things. So, um, but uh, as soon as you can get your learner away from the table practicing the skill you want them to learn, please do that. I see. So I think maybe if we see that either our 
our therapists that, you know, some of us as BCBAs have, have behavior techs, therapists that are working, that we are designing programs for, that perhaps we should consider seeing what needs to be done at the table rather than always starting there first. That's an excellent point. Yes, that's great. You know, and especially if um, there are texts, you know, because because our texts, like some are great at teaching at the table, some right. are great at teaching on the floor. So right. why? So so that's a good point. Why not pr pr uh, prioritize how and where they're teaching based on their strengths, right? Mm -hmm. So that mm -hmm. that way the learner gets the best of both worlds. And, you know, simultaneously, maybe the instructor that's not so great at the table might need like a little extra training to be better at the table. And, you know, the same thing for the instructor that's great at the table and, you know, not so great at spontaneous play, you know, and, and, and engaging kids. Right. I think, I think that's a really important point because I do see texts that are extremely fluent at the table, like their, their ability to manipulate stimuli, their ability to prompt and prompt fade and provide reinforcement or not like there's some great fluency there and then in the natural environment it feels like really forced and really contrived right. trying to like bring those skills that they're great at over there and then like you said some vice versa some i think people are really really great at teaching in the natural environment and capitalizing on the child's interests and and just the natural opportunities but maybe they are less fluent at the table when it was like much more control is required over the stimuli and the presentation. Yeah. All right, great point. So um, it sounds like we can run a lot of varying language targets all the time. Um, do you have any suggestions on how to set up a data sheet? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so there's, so there's a couple of ways. So the first thing to remember, you know, um, Bobby Newman taught me only collect as much data as you need. Mm. And most of the skills that we talked about tonight, you, you can have just a probe, right? You do one cold probe, maybe you do a first last probe, and then the rest of your session is just all teaching. And, and when I'm doing cold probe data or first last probes, I have a preference for doing all of that at the beginning of the session so it's more like a test right like let's you know so we're going to play we're going to test we're going to play we're going to test and all that's done and then the entire rest of the session is just teaching mm. Be because the next session or the next day those data are going to tell us whether what we just did all loose and fancy free is actually working because if it's not then we know we got to tighten some stuff up Right? right, but um, right. I would rather start a little loose and then and then tighten up than just assume we have to start at the table drilling and killing in order to you know get get some acquisition. Right, those are really good points. I think a lot of the time we find consultants who are a bit obsessive over numbers of trials um, and and like criteria, but that. I think you do sacrifice a bit, right? If you are exu exerting so much tight control over the language training that you might lose some of the ability for yourself and your therapist and then therefore the client to express themselves in more novel presentations. Right, makes sense. All right, so um, is there a certain number of, of targets or trials that you think is necessary? Um, so something we didn't talk at all about tonight is uh, rate of acquisition. Mm -hmm. So number of programs, number of targets really has to be customized based on the learner's rate of acquisition or how fast that they learn. Um, you know, um, back um, in the low boss days, I was taught that in like a 40 hour, so for every um, like hour of programming or in, uh, I'm sorry, for every two hours of programming, you have one program on the schedule, right? So if you have a 40 hour week of one-to-one -one instruction, then the child probably has about 20 programs to work on. Um, but that's just kind of like a random, but specific starting point after about your three months into working with a child, the supervisor should calculate how fast 
the instructor, uh, uh, the, 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 the learners acquiring skills within each program and within each skill domain, and then either take away programs, add programs, or say, or say, look, in this one program, he's learning so fast, let's try teaching five targets instead of one, right? So all of those decisions which are, are, you know, can be done with math. Mm -hmm. Right. So using those calculations to see, like, perhaps there are certain skills that need more trials or more teaching or more, you know, uh, presentations to make mm -hmm. sure that it's really solid before moving on. And others, like you're saying, we can combine a few things and make sure that we're really challenging the yes. learner in as many in as many ways as possible, making sure that they're getting a lot of diverse presentations. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so one last question, then I have a comment, is um, if a child says, I don't know, when you're talking about the I don't know program, mm -hmm. and you use the example of a guitar pick, so uh, you said, um, what is this, I don't know, and the next day, um, you said, it would be great if they said guitar pick, like if they're a one trial learner and they, and they do know it. Mm -hmm. Now, if they didn't know it, would you teach, I don't know, or I forgot? Oh, you know what, I would, if, okay, so what I would do, so if I say, hey, do you remember what this is, or what's this, and the child has a blank look on their face, I would just say, mm -hmm. it's a guitar pick, and not expect any kind of response whatsoever after that, and I would just put it away, because mm -hmm. now I have this little object that I can test to see how many trials, how many exposures is it actually going to take him to mm -hmm actually learn it so yeah. like that's that's like a little trick that you can do as like a programmer as someone developing curriculum you stumble across these things and you're like oh let's just put that aside and like let's see is it going to take them a month is it going to take them a year because that is such critical information to developing the curriculum because if if you're working with a child that is on the road to getting close to being like a five trial learner for like then like you have to spend, the, you as the, pro, the person developing the program has to spend a lot of time with that kid to really start teasing out where you are and where you really need to be going. Because if they're mm -hmm. learning at, at that rapid a rate, then mm -hmm. I mean, like the language programming and other programs, you know, you, you, you absolutely have to adjust your plan. That's all there is to it. Mm -hmm. Now that makes that makes a lot of sense. And then you would use a different unknown item to teach the current I don't know target that day. Correct. Okay, great. Now for the past tense combined with a didn't, I think that you emphasize that this is super important. Like, um, no, I didn't. Like the cat did it, or you know, that this is a, <laughs> the 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 kid is saying something that they didn't do. And I think that we cannot underestimate how important that is, especially today, given the highly publicized interactions between police and people with autism or autistic mm. people, that there's some great challenges that come when someone cannot accurately report something they did mm. or did not do. Right. Also, you know, not only for their own responsibility and their ability to express their lack of responsibility at something occurring, but also as, as a witness or something happening with them. Mm. You know, so sure. if they, did you see so-and-so or, did, you know, something like that? I think that that's extraordinarily important for, for people who are growing up, who may have a wealth of staff or family support around them that we have to really make sure we focus on their ability to deny and to negate things that are happening around them or with them, things mm -hmm. that they see or things that they're a part of themselves. Because, um, you know, it's extremely challenging when, when someone who doesn't understand all of this language acquisition, who's trying to have a serious conversation with someone who may truly know the information, but is not accurately verbalizing that mm -hmm. information. Right. You know, that becomes, and then it's really, really tricky to be careful what kinds of questions you ask and how you ask them to try and like tease out the information that the person is giving you. So I'm really, I just wanted to like 
put a, a more emphasis on that because you know as much as it's crucial for kids i think as they grow it becomes increasing increasing increasingly more important that they can accurately report things that did and didn't happen right yeah good point excellent presentation ray thank you so much thank you thank you everyone for joining us have a great night